Most Christians in the West suffer from having had a Western education. And I mean by that that our education system is based on Greek philosophy. It's not based on Hebrew thinking. And it's very difficult for us to realize how deeply that affects us. Now the difference between Greek thinking and Hebrew thinking is this. The Greeks could never somehow relate the physical and the spiritual. These two things were kept so far apart that you couldn't ever see them together. And so by and large the Greeks lived in one of two ways. There were very physical Greeks who lived in the material world and there were very spiritual Greeks who lived in a spiritual world. And so you had on the one hand very self-indulgent people living in the flesh and on the other hand very aesthetic people living in the spirit. But somehow they couldn't get it together. That's had awful effects on Western thinking. We don't know what to do with the Song of Solomon in the Bible, for example. It's a very physical book and people try and find hidden spiritual meanings in it. I once saw a Bible commentary that said, between my two breasts in the Song of Solomon means between the Old and the New Testament. And I thought, help, I need grace badly, because when I read that phrase I don't see the Old and the New Testament. I thought I must be a very carnal Christian. That was all due to my Greek background which can't see the physical and the spiritual together. But the Hebrews said, our God who is spirit made the material world. So the physical and the spiritual are very close together. Therefore miracles can happen every day. Now it's had the effect on Western Christians thinking of saying a physical event can't have a spiritual effect. And that's the basic problem people have with trying to fit water baptism into salvation. They can't see how a physical event can have a spiritual effect because they can't see any tie-up between the two. But the Bible is full of tie-ups between the two. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was a physical tree with physical fruit, but eating it had a profound spiritual effect. I've got a lump of plastic and metal in my study and that lump of plastic and metal can make me very happy, it can make me very sad, it can tempt me and it can also uplift me spiritually. You have to handle it in a certain way, you have to pick up one piece and then do something to the other piece, but it can have extraordinary spiritual effects on me and it's just a lump of plastic. When you take bread and wine at communion, it's just bread and wine. But you could die through eating and drinking. You could certainly be physically ill through taking it, so says my Bible, and it's just bread and wine. When Christ wanted to heal a blind person, he spat, made clay of his spit in the dust, and then smeared it on the eyes, and through that brought sight. Now. Now you can begin to see how to the Hebrew thinking burying and washing someone in a bath of water can clean them up on the inside. God has no problem using water to cleanse your conscience because he's the God who made the water and he's a God who's all-powerful. He can use physical things. Of course we know in the realm of the occult you can play with a Ouija board and you can get through to demons. How much more through water in baptism and through bread and wine in communion you can get through to God? Now then, what's the connection? Well, in the last talk I was trying to show you that baptism is a physical event with a spiritual effect. That's no problem to God. It's only a problem to Western Christians with Greek minds. Do you understand what I'm saying now? Similarly, we've come to the fourth step of being born again, which is to receive the Holy Spirit. And we shall find that in all but two cases in the New Testament, they received the Holy Spirit through a physical act, the laying on of hands. There are only two cases in the whole of the New Testament where people received the Holy Spirit without that physical act. And people say, how can a physical act have a spiritual effect? 
Well, we're rediscovering that our bodies can serve God. We've rediscovered aerobic worship. You know what aerobic worship is? It's when the leader says, hands down, those who want coffee. It's when we use our bodies to worship. And the Bible is full of people using their bodies, lifting up their hands in prayer, clapping God. The Bible says, clap your hands, all you people. People say, oh, I don't want to do anything in my body in worship. I just want to worship God with my soul. But the Hebrews worshipped God with their bodies. They danced before the Lord, they clapped the Lord, they lifted their hands in prayer to the Lord, and they laid hands on people to communicate spiritual power to them. So they, they laid hands on the sick, they laid hands on priests, they laid hands on... And the normal way of receiving the Holy Spirit in the New Testament was to have hands laid on. That is the origin of confirmation. But alas, it's lost that meaning. And I'm afraid with very, very few do they receive the Holy Spirit when they're confirmed. But I know one bishop in this country who's telling people, when I lay hands on you, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And with that faith, it's beginning to happen. But I heard of another where a lady suddenly erupted in a new language at her confirmation and the bishop nearly jumped out of his mitre. <laughs> it, was, it was the first time it had worked. <laughs> but that is the normal way doesn't have to be a bishop, it can be anyone. Ananias laid hands on Saul of Tarsus to receive the Holy Spirit. Now then, the first thing I've got to say then about this is that every Christian needs two baptisms, one in water and one in spirit, so that he is born out of water and out of spirit. Furthermore, if you place too much hope on water baptism, you'll be disappointed. Water baptism deals with your past. It buries the past. It washes the past away. It finishes the past. And it leaves you clean and empty. And that's a very dangerous spiritual condition. Some of the most miserable Christians you'll ever meet are clean and empty. Jesus said, in fact, it's dangerous to clean your life up and leave it empty. Because he said you can get one demon out, but he goes and collects his pals and he comes back and finds the house clean and empty and moves in with six of his friends. And then you've got seven demons. It's vital that once you've got a person cleaned up, that they then get filled. And that is why in the New Testament, as soon as they'd baptized them in water, they then laid hands on them and prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So it's very important not just to get sins out of a person's life, but to see it gets filled with something else or someone else. Because nature abhors a vacuum and human nature abhors a vacuum. And if you're just clean and empty, that's a very dangerous position to be in. You become a negative Christian, you say, well, I don't smoke and I don't drink and I don't gamble and I don't and I don't and I don't and I don't. What a, what a way to live not doing things. Isn't that miserable? No wonder people are miserable. They don't have the pleasures of sin and they don't have the pleasure of salvation. They're locked in the middle, in the wilderness, and they've got all the bad things out of their life and nothing good to take its place. So God in his wisdom says you need two baptisms, one to deal with the past and one to deal with the future. One to get your life emptied and clean and the other to get it filled. And too many have been emptied but not filled. And there's nothing replaced, the pleasures of sin. And the Bible says sin is a pleasure for a season. Doesn't last, but you can enjoy it for a time. But if you don't replace it with anything else, you become a miserable saint. And you'll go on calling yourself that and looking like that. All right, so we are concerned now with a person who's repented and believed and been baptized in water but there is still something more. They have died with Christ, they've been buried with Christ, they need to be raised with Christ to a new life. They need to enter in to the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, and that comes from Pentecost. Just as Easter is repeated in the believer's life, Pentecost needs to be repeated. Yet on Whit Sunday, most Christians seem just to think of something that happened 2,000 years ago. 
but everything that happened 2,000 years ago is meant to happen again in my life. I am to be crucified, I'm to be buried, I'm to be raised, and I'm to be filled. These are not just historical events, they're the first wave, the first pattern. Jesus is called in the Bible our trailblazer, the one who went ahead first and showed us the way where to go. So there is a very real sense in which I follow him in the way, and the first name for Christianity was the way. So the first thing I want to say very clearly is this, receiving the Holy Spirit is not the same thing as repentance. Now very few people get that, those two things confused. Receiving the Holy Spirit is not the same thing as believing. Many Christians have got those two confused. And perhaps the commonest confusion is that the moment you believe in Jesus, that moment you receive the Spirit, whether anything happens or not. That is not borne out in the Scripture. If nothing happened, the Apostles said they haven't received, and they did something about it. Because there isn't a single case in the New Testament of anyone receiving the Spirit and not knowing it. And there is not a case of anyone receiving the Spirit without everyone present on the occasion knowing it. It was a definite experience. So definite that many Bible scholars have made this kind of comment. One scholar said, it was clearly as definite as having an attack of influenza. Now you know when you've got the flu, and so unfortunately do your family and everybody else around you. They know. The tragedy is that thousands of people calling themselves Christians today do not know when or even whether they received the gift that the Apostles received. I said earlier that one of the reasons for this confusion is that we've transferred the word receive from the third person of the Trinity back to the second. Now let me enlarge on that a bit. When Jesus was on earth in the flesh, you could receive him. Literally, you could open the door and say, come in Jesus, sit down and have a meal with us. And it says all through the Gospels that he came to his own people, the Jews, and his own did not receive him, but as many as did receive him, to them he gave authority, not power, he couldn't give power at that stage, he gave authority to become the sons of God. That verse is often used today quite wrongly for the present period. It should not be used in evangelism today. It's a statement about when Jesus was among the Jews in the flesh, and all through the Gospels some people received him, some didn't receive him. But from the day he ascended and the heavens received him out of their sight, never after that was anyone told to receive Jesus. Yet we're doing it all the time. Why do we do it? From the day of Pentecost onwards, in all their preaching, they told people to receive the gift of the Spirit. The person whom Jesus has sent to take his place on earth. Jesus is not on earth in the flesh now. He's seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavens. He has taken his authority. Another person has replaced him on earth. He has sent another comforter, another strengthener like himself. And he, the Holy Spirit, is the person now to receive. But we've taken believing in Jesus and receiving the Spirit, rolled it into one, called it receiving Jesus, and we leave people not knowing whether they have received the Spirit or not. And that's the source of a tremendous lot of confusion. From the day of Pentecost, the preaching was, repent and be baptized and you will receive who? The Spirit. That's what makes a person a Christian. And if any man doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he is not of him. That's the acid test of whether you are accepted by God. Not whether you've repented, not whether you've believed, not whether you've been baptized, but whether you have received the Holy Spirit. Hereby know we that we belong to God and are His children because He has given us of His Spirit. 
That's the very basis of assurance in the New Testament. You cannot know if a person has been justified or received by God or accepted by him until he gives his spirit. That is the seal of God on the whole transaction. It is impossible to say a person belongs to God until that fourth step has been taken, that fourth stage has been reached. Then you know God doesn't give his spirit to the world. The world cannot receive him. Only a true believer can receive his spirit. And that's why that is the proof that you belong to Christ, that you've received his spirit. None of the other three steps can give you proof, but that one can and must. That's the very heart of it. Now let's look at what the New Testament says about the reception of the spirit. I've said, first of all, it's distinguished from re repentance, but very few people think that way. It's not the same as believing, there are too many Christians have got it confused with that, but it's possible to believe in Jesus without receiving the Spirit. That's what happened in Samaria in Acts 8. That's what happened in Acts 19, where Paul had to ask certain disciples, did you receive the Spirit when you believed? Now, I've gone into those passages in great detail in the book, but you need to think them through very carefully. Here is the question I'd like you to ask yourself. It says that in Samaria, after Philip preached and healed, after they heard and saw the gospel, the whole city repented, believed in Jesus, and were baptized into his name. But as yet, none of them had received the Spirit. Now here's the question, which I'll guarantee most of you have never asked. How did anyone know they hadn't received the Spirit. Now, if you think that question through, the whole of the New Testament will open up for you in a different way. How did anyone know? It says they'd repented, believed, been baptized, and were full of joy. And yet, everyone knew they hadn't received the Spirit. How did anyone know? And there's only one possible answer. Only if the reception of the Spirit was always accompanied with outward evidence could anyone have known they hadn't received. Now think that through very carefully. Receiving the Spirit in the New Testament was always an experience with outward evidence. It was always that clear. You may not be able to date when you repented. You may not be able to date when you believed, but you will certainly be able to date when you were baptized, and you will certainly be able to date when you received the Spirit. Because baptism in water and in the Spirit are both so definite that you couldn't possibly have either without knowing it. Now then, let's look at the language that the New Testament uses. By the way, Receiving the Spirit is never in the Bible confused with water baptism. It never happened to a person in their water baptism. It sometimes happened just before, as with Cornelius. More often it happened after their baptism, as with most of the others. But never did anyone receive the Spirit in baptism. Even Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit like a dove, came on him after his baptism and as he was praying. And praying is one of the things associated with receiving the Spirit. The gift needs to be asked for as well as received. So it's not repentance, it's not believing, it's not baptism. It is a separate and fourth thing, which may happen quickly or slowly. But when it happens, it is clear. I mean by slowly, it may happen immediately after baptism or sometime after baptism. When I said it took me 17 years to be born again, it took me 17 years to get these four things. I wish somebody had told me about them all at the beginning. I could have had the whole package. I think I'm talking to some people now who had an equal number of years before they got all these four things. And looking back, don't you wish you had them all at the beginning? Well, let's stop giving our new converts one and a half of these. Let's give them what's been called the Peter package. 
Peter packaged, repent and be baptized and receive the gift of the Spirit. The one thing he didn't mention was faith. Isn't that interesting? Well, he was taking it for granted because they'd already believed what he'd said. Right, now let's look at the language. There are a whole lot of nouns used to describe the reception of the Spirit. Nouns like the promise, which tells you that this was something that God had said he would do, and he did. Joel had given the promise, and sure enough it happened. There's the word gift. That's another noun. There's the word deposit. That's a very interesting word from the commercial word, world. And it says this, that when you receive the Spirit, that's the first down payment that God is going to give you. It's your first little bit of heaven. One of you told me over tea about a church in an Arab Muslim country. And an Arab Muslim said of that church, those people have one foot in heaven. I think that's a beautiful description of a church. People with one foot in heaven. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you've got one foot in heaven. You'll be doing a lot of singing in heaven. And sure enough, when you're filled with the Spirit, you find yourself making melody in your heart. In heaven, there'll be a lot of love and fellowship. And sure enough, when you get filled with the Spirit, there's a lot of love and fellowship. It turns a church into a little foretaste of heaven. When a church is filled with people who've received the Holy Spirit, do you know what people think? When they come into it, they say, if this is what heaven's going to be like, I want to go there. It's a deposit. It's God's first down payment. The rest will follow. But it's a little bit of heaven for you to enjoy right now. It's an earnest. That's another word you'll find in your Bible translating this particular word. Another word, a noun that's used of the reception of the Holy Spirit is renewal. That's come back into popularity. And it means like when you take um, an old piece of antique furniture and you restore it. You have renewed it to its original condition. I know someone whose hobby is renewing vintage Rolls Royces. I don't know how many he's done now, about a dozen I think, but he actually buys an old Rolls Royce and he restores it to its original condition. What a hobby. You've got to have a bit of money, I think, to do that, and an awful lot of patience. But what a wonderful hobby to restore Rolls-Royce cars to their original condition. Renewal is God restoring you to your original condition. Just think of that. Here's a shock to you. You won't believe this, but one day you'll see me perfect. Now, those who know me well here are looking down at their boots now and <laughs> pull the other one. I can see it on their faces. But God hasn't finished with me yet. Like the dear brother in America prayed, Lord, I ain't what I ought to be, and I ain't what I was going to be, but I sure ain't what I was. <laughs> I like that. That man's understood salvation. The renewal of the Holy Spirit means God is restoring you to your original condition. Now, those are all the nouns, but there's a wealth of verbs. And the Bible prefers verbs to nouns because they're more dynamic, they're more active. And when I look at all the verbs, well, there are verbs like given, received. Well, a gift has to be given and a gift has to be received. There's this word baptized, which we've seen means plunged or dipped, plunged into the Holy Spirit. There's the word filled. That's another verb that's used for this moment of receiving. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. There's the word fall on, come upon, and poured out upon. What a lot of liquid words there are connected with the Spirit. Have you ever noticed? Poured out upon, baptized in, very fluid words are being used here. That's, that's like our word downpour. <laughs> when you get receive the Holy Spirit, there's a downpour takes place. Uh, then there's the word seal. That's another commercial word. And when a man had bought some property, he would put his seal upon it before he could take it all home so that it said to everybody else, this property is mine, it belongs to me. It's a visible mark of belonging to someone. 
we're sealed with the Holy Spirit when we receive the Holy Spirit. Other people know we now belong to God. They can see it. Another word is anoint. As the Old Testament kings and priests were anointed with oil, we are kings and priests anointed with the Holy Spirit, as Jesus was anointed with power and went about doing good. All these words. Now listen, that could hardly happen to anybody without them knowing it, could it? Can you imagine somebody getting a downpour, being plunged into something, having it fall upon them, and not knowing anything had happened? It's almost inconceivable. And because so many Christians today don't know whether it's happened or not, they tend never to use these words. And you can tell whether a person knows they have received the Spirit with whether they find it natural to use these terms from the New Testament. If nothing really happened to you, I'll guarantee you won't say, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. If nothing happened, I'll guarantee you will never say, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. If nothing actually happened, I'll guarantee you'll never say the Holy Spirit fell on me. This is the kind of language you only use of an event with outward experience. Or sorry, an experience with outward evidence. Let's get it right. It's like an attack of the flu. You know it, and everybody else knows it. So we've got a big question now. How do you know it? What is the outward evidence that a person has received? The Holy Spirit. Well, I've found the easiest way is to start with that word, filled. How do you know when anything is filled? How do you know when your petrol tank is filled? Can't get anything more in, that's a novel one. <laughs> that's the more usual way. An overflow. You only know when a jug is full, when it overflows. You only know when a person is full, when they overflow. Whatever you're full of, said Jesus, will come out of your mouth. Because the heart, when it's full of something, that's where it comes out. If it's full of dirt, it'll come out of your mouth. Nothing going into your mouth can make you unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth from your heart. If you're full of fun, you laugh. I've heard you overflow more than once this afternoon. You've laughed. Because when you're full of fun, it's got to come out somewhere. That's the overflow. When you're full of anger, where does it come out? Well, sometimes it might come out of there, but more usually, in Christian circles, we don't use that. We use this <laughs> when we want to be angry. It comes out of your mouth and you shout. When you're full of sorrow, what do you do? You howl. People can hear you're full of sorrow because it's overflowing out of that hole. Whatever you're full of, the mouth is the overflow. Now, just to take up a little thing we had in the song earlier, you said when we get the Spirit, we have the inward testimony that God is our Father. But my Bible says, when you cry out, Abba, that's the Spirit bearing witness with you, that you belong to God. It's a cry out. It's not an inward thought or feeling. It's a kradzine, that's the Greek word. It's what you do when you shout out involuntarily. It's when you go, ah! Have you ever done that? When you've shouted, you know, backseat drivers do it quite a bit. <laughs> you know, <so>, ah! <laughs> and I sometimes hear it, don't I, darling? <laughs> But uh, you cry out. The Greek word means to cry out involuntarily, to say something you didn't intend to say. If you find yourself shouting, Abba! I remember a fisherman in the Shetland Islands. I began my ministry in 1950 in the Shetland Islands. It seems years ago now. And I remember a great big fisherman called Dordy Pottinger getting up in the prayer meeting and this great big fisherman in his navy blue fisherman's jumper, he just stood there and with tears running down his cheeks, he just kept crying, Abba, Abba, Abba. And you know, years later I was in Israel and I saw a little boy running after his daddy, shouting, Abba, Abba, Abba. My mind went back to Dordy Pottinger. When you cry out, Abba, the Spirit is bearing witness with your spirit that you are the child of God. It's a crying out. It's not something inward, it's outward. 
It's something overflowing from the mouth, it's something coming out. Now, it may be one of a variety of things. One of the most common things mentioned in the New Testament is this horrible word, tongues. I hate that word. The word is languages. And God speaks all the languages. Did you know God was not English? In spite of the authorized version of the Bible, God isn't English. It was God who first gave languages at the Tower of Babel to separate men and women so they couldn't get on together without him. But on the day of Pentecost, he gave different languages to bring people together again. And since God speaks every language, it's not surprising that when he fills you up, you find yourself speaking a language you never learned. I was speaking in the Colston Hall of Bristol and I just said, you can receive the Spirit where you sit, ask Jesus to give you his Holy Spirit. And a housewife sitting in the front row just said, Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And he did, and she opened her mouth and she poured out Urdu, the language of Pakistan. Praised God beautifully in Urdu. And there was a Pakistani gentleman about six seats from her, leapt out of his seat, he thought, hey, there's somebody from my home village here. <laughs> And he was so disappointed to find it was a Bristol housewife, <laughs> though he got something from what she was saying. Yeah, it could be a different language. It doesn't have to be. There are other things that came out of their mouths in the New Testament. But listen, if someone says to me, must I speak in tongues, I say, I wish you hadn't asked that. I wish you'd said, may I speak in tongues? Because then I will say yes. As soon as you say, must I, it means you're reluctant as if God is forcing something on you you don't want. May I? Yes, you may. It's a beautiful gift. It's the only gift of the Spirit that helps you. All the other gifts are to help someone else. But that's just for you to help yourself, to edify yourself. Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. That's one of the secrets of how he could get through stoning and whipping and shipwrecked. Do you ever wonder how he managed to get through those? He said, I speak in tongues more than you all. I never use it in church, but in private I do it more than anybody. And that edified him and strengthened him. It could be an outburst of praise. I prayed for a very shy, reserved missionary who told me frankly, I don't know if I've ever received the Holy Spirit. Would you pray for me? We were sitting in a public park in Latin America loads of people around, laid hands on him and just said, Lord Jesus, fill him with your spirit. And he opened his mouth and he said, Hallelujah! <laughs> and everybody looked around and I kind of shrank into the grass and <laughs> I sort of disowned him for a bit. And finally I turned back to him and I said, I'll bet you've never done that before in your life. He said, no, I haven't. I'm not that kind of person. And then he said, is that it? <laughs> I said, well, that's good enough for me. I just heard you overflow. And within 24 hours, he'd healed two sick people, which he'd never done before. He knew. There is always an overflow of some form of spontaneous speech. And spontaneous spiritual speech is known in the scripture as prophesying. Whether it takes the form of a new language or your own language, that spontaneous spiritual speech that overflows from your mouth is the proof in the New Testament that the gift of the Spirit is now yours. And my 40 minutes is gone, so I'll finish this talk in the next talk. <laughs> All right, I'm not quite finished with it, but we'll pick it up again in the last and final talk.